So our first presentation is by Karen, and that's NGSS. The second one, a little bit later, is going to be by Harry Stuckey. Harry Stuckey is going to be talking to us about brief history of neutrinos. I'm really looking forward to that. The first one being uh, Carolyn Libretto, she's going to talk to us about the NGSS and NISLIS. Now, the only NGSS and NISLIS stuff that we get in my school is mostly biology re related. It, uh, we they don't have a, few, a whole lot of examples for physics related things. I'm thrilled that, that Karen is going to walk us through phenomena for NGSS right. and NISLIS. Okay, let's give her a round of applause. Please. I'm Karen Libretto. I've been teaching here at Northport Heights High School for 18 years. Greg Guido is my colleague. And uh, over the last few, five years maybe, we've been trying to align as much as our curricula with NG SS. Um, we started a NISLIS working group, a round table amongst teachers on Long Island that kind of fizzled out with COVID. And then I entered the New York State Master's Teachers Program. And Mitch and I, over the last four years, have been working on creating NGSS aligned activities and even assessments. Um, so this is just a little mirage of some NGSS activities that I have put together, uh, some of them with the help of Greg Guido. One I stole an idea from Rich, which you don't even know about, so I can give you credit for. Um, but today I'm going to focus mostly on uh, anchoring activities and phenomena. I do try to start out every lesson with some sort of phenomena most likely just a gift, but today we're going to work on using phenomena as anchoring activities. Um, you should all be aware that NGSS is starting to incorporate itself into our curriculum. Uh, my boys are in elementary school, so they're, they're experiencing that. Jillian and I have also piloted some elementary school science NGSS lessons. So as of next June, we're going to see the rollout for biology and earth science. And then the following year, it's upon us, chemistry and physics. So um, we're, we have to be prepared for that. Traditionally, the teacher is the center of focus, right? They're the content, content expert. They're the one modeling the facts. They're the, we're the <laughs> ones demonstrating the phenomena. And we explain what everything is to the students over and over again, line after line after line. And the student's job is to recall those facts, to be able to repeat those demonstrations in their laboratory experiments, and then just summarize what we've already told them to summarize. Um, so if we take a look at higher order thinker thinking, um, Typically, we traditionally start from the bottom up. So we tell them all the information that they need to know, and we expect them to remember it. And then we have we lead them into applying that information, and we cross our fingers that they understand and can interpret and summarize and explain and paraphrase and discuss everything. And then we can maybe expect them to create or evaluate or analyze and put all of that together. But the NGSS model doesn't work from the bottom up. It literally starts at the top. And you don't specifically focus on one ability. You kind of just do everything all at the same time. But we expect the students to be able to create, evaluate, and analyze. So we're, our job is to help lead them into um, developing those skills. All right, skills that they will need later on in life to succeed in their career in college. So with NGSS, our job is to be the facilitator. We are coaches. Anyone here coach? Okay. Um, or maybe you can think of yourself as a thought partner. Uh, where we adjust student supports. Some students might need more support. Some students need a, don't need as much. We help them engage properly. They're developing their social skills. We have to teach them how to question appropriately, 
how to partake in appropriate dialogue, um, how to just do a question formulating technique. So just write down every single question and then later go through those questions uh, to redirect them, to monitor their progress. Maybe they're going off on a complete tangent or maybe they're leading down a rabbit hole or perhaps they just have preconceived notions that are incorrect and they just keep going with that. Our job is to realign them and adjust them. All right, students, their job now is to demonstrate expectations. They're gonna develop and use the curriculum and the content and they, the skills that they have developed, that's what they will use to problem solve and answer questions. Um, and then they will use this, the, the behavior of the system that they're exploring, right? Not just what we've told them to expect a direct relationship. They are going to see what they're exploring and the behavior of that system will help them understand and describe uh, all the dynamic interactions that are going on. So where to begin, okay? This is my Fido can. Some people call it a rollback can, okay? Um, so when I get to energy, I simply just take this can. They can maybe hear that there's something inside of it, but you try to do a little discreetly. And I said, okay, here's my, my little Fido here. And um, I'm just going to roll them forward. Come back, Fido. Yeah, good boy. And he comes back. And Fido's a really good dog. So, come on, Fido. Come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good boy. And that's it. It's a very simple demonstration where all you need is, I find that the, the baking powder or baking soda cans, I know sometimes baking soda comes in a box, um, works very well. All you need is just a larger rubber band, something to poke a hole, and I use about a hundred kilogram, a hundred gram, hundred gram mass. Uh, um, and then you just tape it to the rubber band, and um, and then on the outside, yeah, you just tie a knot. Sometimes I put a paper clip. This one seems like it's on the fritz. And it's just inside like that. Um, so. You can, if you take a look at the activity that I have for that one, investigation number 11, we have a, I did a little predict, reason, observe, describe, um, where students will first predict what happens after the can is released. So I tell them that the can is going to be rolled forward. They'll predict what will happen. According, at this point, we've already done Newton's laws and mechanics. So they'll probably say that it will roll forward and just eventually slow down. Um, and then they'll, they'll explain about, I'm sure they'll refer to forces. At this point, they haven't learned anything about kinetic energy, but in middle school, they learned about that. So who knows, maybe they'll in incorporate that. Then they'll observe, they'll describe what is happening, and then they're going to create a model. So I give them, I re-explain to them what a model is because for my students this might, I'm trying to recall, this might be their first model of the year. Um, and then you can see by the other ones we do a lot more thereafter. So this I think is their first introduction to a model. So we explain what a model is, right? So a model is a simplified representation of a system that can explain and help make predictions regarding phenomena rather than defining a specific concept. And they're very used to diagrams, maybe labels, and at this point, hopefully a little bit of mathematics. Um, and we'll also show them how to annotate those, those models. Um, so the first one's kind of like a free-for-all. And um, when Greg and I designed our rooms, you can see this was the, the layout that we chose. We chose to have students work in groups of three so this is something that they would collaborate with their groups. But on all of my laboratory investigations, I have partners written down. If you look at all of these, there is no place for partners. And that's because this is where we're going to encourage dialogue, not only between what I call their table mates, 
but then also their neighbors and then their neighborhoods. Um, so they would start out with their table, mate, table mates creating their model and then they can discuss it in what I call a chime with their neighbors and then with their, their neighborhood. So that they would create their first diagram. You can see some of the leading questions that I use as well. Like how does the structure contribute to its function? What are the boundaries of the system, right? Um, is just the rubber band and the mass the system? Is it just the can? Is it the can and the floor? Um, under what conditions is there a change? So I'll, I'll ask them, do you want to see it again? Do you want me to do something differently? Um, ultimately, I would love to have one for each student, but we know what they would all do. They would open it up, they would shake it, they would peel it around. So this one I find is better just to do up front. Uh, what's going on at the unobservable level? Doesn't really affect us too much here, uh, but when we get to electrostatics, we'll see that. How do energy and our matter flow in and out or within the boundaries and what patterns do I notice? So this, the first model is usually pretty interesting. And then after a few days of lessons and giving them evidence, once you've taught kinetic energy, potential energy, um, elastic potential energy, then they're very quick to pick up on this. Okay. Any questions on the, the Fido can, the rollback can? Is that something you think you could see yourselves incorporating into your room? Karen, can you just discuss timing? Like how long do you give them and when do you cycle back? That kind of thing? So this activity, the mod so it this one you can see is designed over two days. Um, so I would say this whole first activity, since this is their first time modeling this would be a whole period. Um, yeah, this and this would be a whole period. Then it depends on how your energy unit is formatted, right? I do work first, then I do the three types of energy. So it might be a week later, maybe some other activities. I do a, a running up the stairs, a personal power lab, so that might be in there. Um, so this, the second model might happen a week later. And once again, since this is the first time that my students are modeling, this most likely would take, I'd say 20 minutes to 30 minutes. And then we would go over it and explain, you know, what we should have in it, um, what makes a good model. I did include a supplemental page because I do have another activity that I do. If you look in the back of the room, I'm set up for one of my classes on Monday. They're going to do the light activity. Um, and this is something that Greg started years ago, right? And, uh, you know, we've added a, a few other things in there. Um, so we, I also have an energy unit that has multiple stations. I didn't photocopy it because everyone would be like, well, what's this station, what's that station? Um, you can see the roller coaster station is still left out. Um, but uh, this is something that I do with them where they, before I teach them anything about transfer and transformation. Um, so I just threw that on the back if you wanted a supplemental page. Um, because I think that I'm, as we do more and more modeling in NGSS, it takes up a lot of time. So I'll probably cut out my energy stations lab in the future. Because I'm always the farthest behind of all the physics teachers every year. All right, so anchoring phenomena. So did the rollback can. Next, I'm going to do the rope pull. Rich this idea from him. Do you remember when? You showed us this? There you go. Tesla mania. You had just lost your voice. Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe like four years ago. So can I borrow you? Sure. Yeah. Mitch, can I borrow you? 
You really don't remember? <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a look at investigation number six. So with this one, this is not the most exciting, but this is the anchoring activity that I come back to the most. So I start off with vectors first, then I go into forces. So I have two student volunteers come up. I say, can you guys pull the rope so that you are pulling with equal force, that your forces are balanced? <laughs> All right, they do that pretty easily. So if you look at the introduction, it says throughout your life you've pushed and pulled trillions of objects from the youngest of ages you've began perfecting your ability to push and pull with an appropriate amount. Using that knowledge, we'll explore vectors in greater depth, right? So then I say to the class, well, how, like, or, or how do you guys know that you're pulling with equal force? We're not moving. They're not moving, right? Because then now, if we pull at a greater force, now we see some sort of motion, okay? And then we, they pretty easily, they draw in the rope, and then they draw the two vectors. So then we explain, okay, well, how do we know that they were balanced? And they say, well, they were pulling equally in opposite directions. So I try to build upon their pre-existing knowledge. Okay, so now you guys pull again, and I want you to counteract my force. <laughs> right, and then I usually get like four or five boys so they keep pulling. Right, and I'll even get my pinky and I'll, I'll push. And no matter what, the <coughs> physics teachers know that they, they can't, okay? So then I said, all right, let's draw in all of the forces. So we draw in the rope, they draw me pushing down, and I say, you know, were we balanced? And right away, what do they say? No. No, we weren't balanced. I said, oh, well, let's go back before you said that we were balanced because we were? And, but how, how did we observe that we weren't moving? Yeah. All right, so let's try again. We're not moving. So what does that tell us what's going on? The forces have to be balanced. And I say, all right, show me. Show me how you know they're balanced. It depends on the level that you're working with. If I do this with my honors and my SI students, they get this part immediately. And if one table isn't getting it, as soon as they turn and discuss with another table, this part takes three minutes. Regents, this takes like 10 minutes, this part. Um, so then they're drawing in the horizontal components and the vertical components. So it really depends on what ability you're working with. Then I love turning to the back. And say, so right, look at these three vectors. Are they balanced? And 90% of the students or if you're teaching regions, it's usually almost 100% of the students say, oh no, no, those definitely aren't balanced. And so with my IB and my SI classes, they, like I said, they figure this out pretty quickly within minutes and then um, some of them, they uh, might draw the horizontal and vertical components. Some of them will do vector slides so there's multiple ways in which they can come about proving that the resultant is zero. Um, but then with my region students, this, does, this is a full period activity because it takes them a lot longer to get to that the horizontal components cancel out. And then we also, we write down the numbers, right? So the first vector is, has a horizontal component of negative four we have positive seven and negative three. So then we show that they all add to zero. And then same thing with the vertical components. Um, so that, I find this is very useful because then once we do get to Newton's laws, it just reinforces the fact that whenever anything is at rest, and then once we get to Newton's laws, we also explain constant speed or velocity that the, all the forces are balanced. So this one, is just very useful and helpful, and like I said, I refer back to a lot. Should we just leave you guys standing there? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you.